allow me to work out uh, some of the kinks, some of the kinks with using Zoom. I've used it quite a bit, but I've had a couple of glitches in the past. And so I just wanted to make sure everything's great. All right. So uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar today. This is part one of the step-by-step -step guide to creating your own nonprofit. I'll introduce myself real quick. My name's Annette Russ, and I'm a retired CPA from Chico, California. And I've been mentoring business clients through the uh, Nationwide SCORE organization since 2020. Uh, I own and operate my own accounting firm, and I've mentored many business clients as well as uh, nonprofits. Uh, in 2008, personally, I started a nonprofit in Kenya, who, and our mission in Kenya was to uh, educate girls beyond secondary school so that they could escape uh, poverty. So the things I'm gonna be talking about today, I have actually uh, gone through myself. So let's do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. You will, um, once the meeting's concluded, you will get the PowerPoint presentation that I am doing today so that you will have this as a reference and you won't have to take notes. You can just refer to the PowerPoint presentation. The other thing is, is that we're recording this session and you can also request a recording of the session if you'd like to see it again in person. So let's start out by talking a little bit about exactly what is a nonprofit. Because sometimes there's some confusion about how you, what entity that you're operating under when you decide to start a nonprofit. Actually, a nonprofit is a business that is not focused on making a profit. They are, as you can see, it's an organization and you focus on the public good you do by furthering a social cause. So what that means is for my nonprofit in Kenya, we don't use a dollar amount to uh, judge the success of my nonprofit. What we have done is we set goals about how many, what type of a program we wanna run, and how many beneficiaries we wanna serve and use those type of goals for measuring the success of my nonprofit. So a nonprofit is actually a corporation that has been given tax exempt status through the IRS. And the code section is 501C and three is a, what's called a public benefit nonprofit. And Again, it's been given tax exempt status because it does, it furthers a religious, scientific, charitable, educational, literally public safety or some such cause that you might choose for your own nonprofit. So that's key. There's two key things here. Let me just reiterate. It's, it's a organization that operates based on measuring a success by a certain set of goals, such as how many beneficiaries that you are serving. And it's a corporation at the same time that has been given tax exempt status from the IRS. There's also something else that um, is confusing to people is not only are there nonprofits, but there's something that is termed a not-for-profit organization. And the difference between these two is that a not-for-profit organization serves only the interest of its members. So these are organizations that have members, whether they uh, have some sort of a, a membership dues or a, a free kind of a membership. They have members, they're not serving the public in general. So there are other IRS code sections that talk about these kind of not-for-profits. And as you can see here, there are things like 
civic leagues, and homeowners associations. There's also a section for labor unions, a section for like chambers of commerce or social and recreation clubs uh, like youth soccer or um, childcare related organizations. So for the most part, I'm going to assume that the participants here that are going to start a nonprofit are probably doing it to further a social, social clause called a charity. Okay, I wanna pause here real quick because I noticed we have some chats and I wanna address that in the fact that uh, there will be a lot of information here. There's a lot to unpack. And as we go along, I would like to encourage you to save your questions to the end. And then I can address all the questions at the end. And there will be a pretty significant question and answer session at the end. But for just a moment, I'm gonna look at the chats that I've received so far. I've been answering some questions there in the chat, just uh, letting everyone know, I'll email the presentation and link to recording to everybody. And the presentation, are, are you going up until 11.30, Annette? Yes, I am. Okay. So, or, or maybe a little bit shorter, depending on how we go and how many um, questions and answers there are. Okay, so there's a question here in the chat for you. Maybe you can address it. It says, what would artist co-ops fall under? Artist co-ops would fall under a nonprofit organization, unless that you have some sort of a, a membership. Uh, if you are serving the public, that's the key phrase here. If you are serving the public or if you have your artist co-op and you're only allowing members into the uh, artist co-op, then you're gonna be a not-for-profit organization. And you would probably fall under something like a social or recreational club. So when you go to the IRS code and look up section 501C7, you will be able to read a little more in detail about what type of a nonprofit you're gonna be. But if again, if you're serving the public, then you're gonna be a 501c3, like we talked about on this previous slide. And uh, let's see, on this previous side, you're gonna be a charity who, and you will look at the 501c3 code so I hope that answers the question. And again, uh, let me know at the end of the, uh, through the chat or the question and answers at the end of the presentation, if you have more questions that I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so let's look a little bit, I guess I hope this will also clarify that earlier question about what the mission of your organization is. And here's a couple of examples. So Heifer International is a nonprofit because it furthers a social cause. So it says it works with communities to increase income, improve child nutrition, care for the earth, and ultimately world in world hunger and poverty. So that's their social mission. Whereas a not-for-profit organization, as is the Chamber of Commerce, it's the voice of a local business and through its legislative action committee advocates on behalf of businesses regarding local and state legislation, et cetera, et cetera. And as you may already know, you have to join the Chico Chamber of Commerce as a mission, as a member, I'm sorry, as a member. So when you start your not-for-profit, you are gonna have a mission statement that is gonna be basically formatted like these, and we'll also point to if you're actually not profit, nonprofit or a non-for-profit organization. So this is the nuts and bolts of creating nonprofit. This webinar is going to talk about the technical issues with all of the forms and paperwork 
that you need to create in order to start a nonprofit. So there will be a part two to this seminar that will talk separately about the nuts and bolts of operating your nonprofit. And we'll talk about the actual day-to-day -day operations of your nonprofit. And so that is the kind of a webinar that if you're not interested in the technical side of it, you might want to check out part two. So one of the, uh, when you create a nonprofit, it's a two-step process. Um, and this is kind of goes back to what I said in the previous slides, is that the first step is that you actually form a regular corporation. And the second step is you take that corporation and you apply to the IRS to qualify for tax exempt status. So tax exempt status means that, you know, you take in donations, you take in proceeds from fundraisers that you've had, and you do not have to pay tax on, the, on that fundraising. So I have another question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let's talk about how you do that. A, a good place to start is at, to access the Attorney General of California's Guide for Charities, basically. And I have included a link right here where you can go to see what that, that is all about. I'm going to click on that really quickly. And this is the... Uh, Attorney General's page, where you can read all about charities. Again, a lot of information on here, but you'll want to uh, look at this at some point to get a little bit more information. However, what I want to say is this booklet is immense. Look at all the chapters it has. It has 96 pages, as well as uh, appendices beyond that. So this is a place that if you need more detailed information than what I give you on today's uh, webinar, this is an opportunity for you to go there and look up all of these type of uh, topics, forming a, forming a corporation, uh, what are members of a public benefit corporation? What, do you, what are the rules and regulations around fundraising? Uh, looking at how you record nonprofit transactions in your, in your records and what are nonprofit transactions. And we're just going to hit some of the highlights of this today and kind of distilling it down into the basics of how you're going to create the nonprofit. So, uh, this is a place you can go for reference, but it, it's overwhelming. So we're just gonna uh, talk about the, the basics in this webinar. So first of all, what most people wanna do is figure out a name of their nonprofit. And what needs to be done is a couple of steps. And this is what you can do with a name. You have to be able to have an appropriate and available name for the corporation. And that when you do a corporation, it is a distinct legal entity under Cal California law. The corporation is not you personally. The corporation exists with a board of directors. And so the, you're naming your corporation. The regulations state that you cannot use a name that might mislead the public, or you can't use the name of an existing corporation. And I'll talk a little bit in a second about how you determine if there is an existing corporate, uh, corporation who already has that same name. When you start to go through the paperwork and submit the forms to the California Secretary of State, to form your corporation. At that time, that is when the California Secretary of State's office is gonna look for compliance. So 
if you have unwittingly named your uh, nonprofit corporation the same as somebody else that already exists in California, they will send you correspondence and tell you that that name is not acceptable. Here is the place where you can go to find out if your name is available. This is the California Secretary of State's webpage. And I will show you a little bit more in detail down the line here about what else is on the California Secretary of State's webpage. But you can go to this and you can go to the search function and you can enter in your potential name and search for it. And if there is somebody with a similar name or uh, exact same name, it will show up here, which will tell you that you need to alter the name of your nonprofit so that you will be in compliance with the Secretary of State's regulations. So this is the place, this is the place where you're gonna stop and uh, look at to see if your name's available to begin with. Okay, so the next part that we're gonna talk about is once you've got your name, how do you form a corporation? And there's quite a few steps to do this. It could be a little daunting. It could be a little daunting. Sorry, that was my timer. So there are basically three steps in forming a corporation. First of all, all corporations have a board of directors. And when you start a nonprofit corporation, you are gonna to need to enlist people on your board of directors. Basically, your board of directors can have just you if, as the founder on the board of directors, but I highly recommend, and we'll talk more about this when I talk about operations of the nonprofit, is that you'll basically, I really recommend that you have three, at least three people on your board of directors. You're gonna to wanna to have the president. You're gonna to wanna to have a secretary who does all the admin things for your nonprofit. And you're gonna to wanna to have a treasurer so that you have somebody that separate from you personally that will be doing all the money transactions and having that separation between the president and the treasurer is a nonprofit best practices. And having that gives your donors, once you start doing fundraising, the assurance that uh, the money is being managed in a way that you are uh, promising to use for your beneficiaries. It just gives people assurance that you're on the up and up if you have three board of directors and a separate treasurer from the founder so that there is no chance that the founder may be misusing the funds. Okay, the next thing you'll have to do in order to form a corporation is to create an article of incorporation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then the third thing that you'll need to do is to write your nonprofit corporation's bylaws. And I'll talk also a little bit more about that. So this is the California Secretary of State's website. And when you are there, you can look at the forms section. If you choose the forms section, what you'll see on here is that there's all kinds of initial filing documents on this website that you don't have to come up with articles of incorporation from scratch. What they have done at the California Secretary of State is provided nonprofits with a template to fill out in order to create your articles of incorporation, which is great because if you research articles of incorporation on the website, you will quite often find a template that's not going to be applicable to nonprofits, or you might uh, land on a website where it says uh, they can help you to write your articles of incorporation, but there will be a fee charge. And you, you don't need to do a fee. You don't need to go to uh, the legal sites 
that will help you do this and charge you a fee. Right here is where you can get the template that is most appropriate to a nonprofit on the, on the California Secretary of State. Okay, what this is, is uh, the Articles of Incorporation right here. This is a, a example of what you're gonna find. And what it's gonna ask for is the corporate name, the business address. This does not have to be an address separate from the founder's uh, home address. It can be the same. You don't have to have a separate location or a separate address. There has to be somebody uh, who is kind of in charge of doing the agency of your corporation. So that is a, something that you'll need to fill in. Then you'll have the purpose statement, basically. And then additional, it will ask you for additional statements that they would like for you to attach as well to the articles of incorporation. So this is form. A, it, I'm going to put form numbers in here. And once again, you can, uh, you'll get a copy of this presentation, which you can use for reference. But the form that you're going to see for a nonprofit is ARTS PB 501C3. If you're a not for profit, you will be choosing a different article of incorporation and it will show the, the 501C classification that you're going to, to be qualified under by the IRS. So for example, this might say 501C4, 501C5, like we talked about previously on the previous slide. So the next step that you'll need to create are bylaws. And a lot of people who have not done corporations are going, what the heck are bylaws? And what do I need to do to create my bylaws? So basically bylaws are the operating manual and they talk about the basic rules for the corporation's governance, how things are governed within. And it's a, an official document where you outline all of these things on a page. So basically it's how directors and officers are elected and removed. It, the bylaws will have a paragraph discussing that. You, it will talk about board and membership meetings and how they can be called. So if, can the president call for it? Can the secretary call for it? Can uh, a different board of directors member call for it? Uh, that is specified. It talks about how certain corporate decisions are made. And that would be something like with the consensus of the board of directors. And then within your nonprofit organization, you will have probably committees set up of volunteers who will assist with the operations of the nonprofit. And it will be committees like fundraising or social media or uh, event planning. And what you want to do in the bylaws is to specify how the committees operate so that this becomes a document of communication with the people that you have in your organization, not just on your board of directors, but also uh, with other volunteers that you may have who are serving on committees and doing functions of your, uh, of your nonprofit. There is a place that I wanna show you that you can actually uh, do a template that is free for forming your nonprofit bylaws. And this organization is called Form Swift, and it allows you to create the co corporation just by filling in the template. So let's look at this sample real quick. So here's a sample of nonprofit bylaws. It's got the preamble, the name, the purpose, but scroll down here, uh, what you're gonna do with the assets. So if you have equipment that you are using within your nonprofit, you have to delineate what, what that is about, what your board of directors is gonna be about, 
what happens if there's vacancies and such. So this is a great website, again, tailored exactly to nonprofits that you're able to uh, go to and take advantage of using a template instead of trying to create this from scratch. From scratch. Okay, I'm gonna stop a second because I do have a couple of chats and I just wanna reiterate if you would Go ahead and uh, I'll, you can write your chats in here. I wanna reiterate this, write your chat questions in here, but I will take time at the end of the presentation to address all those, uh, those informations at that time. So instead of you know, disrupting the presentation as we go along. So going to Form Swift, go ahead and write your bylaws. So here's what you have to do now with those documents that you just created, which is the Articles of Corporation and the bylaws. So here are the forms that you have to file. You have to file the Articles of Corporation with the Secretary of State and pay the related fees. The next thing you have to do because you're a nonprofit is you have to register with the California Registry of Charitable Trusts. And I will show you that website uh, a little bit down the line. And the other thing that you need to do is you need to file for a federal identification number for your corporation. And we'll look at this form as well. So this is, we just talked about, and let's go back real quickly. We talked about this form. This is the form that you're going to file with the Secretary of State in order to officially be a corporation. So we've talked about that form already. And again, as you can see, it's the ART BP form. Now, the next thing is to register with the Office of Attorney General. And this is, whoops. Sorry. This is the form that you're going to do with that. And on here, you can see that I have the website address that you can go to in order to get this registration form. And I believe that most of these forms are online at the moment, which is great. You don't have to print them off and uh, mail them in anymore. And it really speeds up the process. And you know, it takes the hassle out of doing, you know, printing it out and mailing it in. Although I always totally recommend that you keep a copy of this form on your computer or I printed out one so that you always have this for future reference. And so you'll see that it also asks all about the organization right here that you're gonna to have to fill in. So this is the registration for the attorney general. Here's, or I, here's the, I'm sorry, let me, I misspoke. This previous one is a form that you're gonna find on the office of the attorney general registry of charitable trusts. This is separate from the California secretary of state website. And when you go to that website, this is the landing page. And this landing page has a ton of information on it. It's a little bit of a condensation of the booklet that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, where you, but you can look at specific sections and it's a little bit written a little bit in a more understandable format. So again, the booklet has all this detail and can be really difficult to sort through. And you can go to the, the Attorney General's Registry of Charitable Trusts and they'll give you a lot of the same information and you can get the forms as I talked about. The next thing that we I mentioned that you need to do is to file for a identity number with, um, this is with the IRS. You, 
you'll need to file for an employer identification number with the IRS. And this is called an SS4. So basically, you'll want to go to the IRS website and look for form SS4. And again, you could do this online and you can uh, fill this out and submit this as well. So this is your, your application for your, uh, it's called the federal uh, employer ID number. And that's a number that you're gonna use uh, all throughout as you go uh, all throughout with uh, corresponding with the IRS. So this is an important form. So once you have filed, form your corporation, filed all those forms, the next step is that you have to apply for exempt status. You must form the corporation, register with the charitable, uh, registry of charitable trusts, and then you can apply for the IRS tax exempt status. And again, I'm using 501c3 as an example here. Whereas if you are a different type of a, if you're a not-for-profit under one of the other code sections, uh, you basically have to do this exact same step. But I just happen to have 501c3 here. But you also need to file for exempt status if you are a not-for-profit organization. And let's look a little bit about the forms about that you're going to use to accomplish this. The main form that you're going to use to apply is called the Form 1023. And there's actually two iterations of Form 1023. There's a short form, which is called the 1023EZ. And you will find this questionnaire on the IRS uh, website where you can answer yes or no to these questions and find how you can, if you qualify for the 501, or uh, I'm sorry, if you qualify for the 1023EZ form, which is a lot easier form to fill out than the 20, 1023 long form. But the key element of this worksheet is do you project your annual gross receipts to exceed 50,000 in any of the next three years? A lot of people ask me, should they file for the 1023 EZ, file the 1023 EZ first? And if their uh, gross receipts exceed 50,000, go ahead and uh, reapply using the form 1023 long form. And my recommendation is if you anticipate at any given time in, as operating as a nonprofit, if you anticipate that you are ever gonna exceed $50,000 in gross receipts, that you go ahead and do the 1023 long form. It can be a real hassle to convert from the 1023 EZ and then go back and apply under the 1023 long form. So just to be on the safe side, I would uh, recommend that you file, unless you're very, very small and you know you're never gonna have over 50,000 bucks in gross receipts, that you go ahead and file the 1023 long form. Let's look at the 1023. Here's the actual 1023 EZ form that you would fill out. And like I said, it's much simpler. It's much more condensed. It's easier. Let's look though, however, at the 1023 regular form. And this is uh, the long form. It happens to be 40 pages long, which is crazy. So that it actually takes quite a bit of thought process in order to fill out your 501c3 form 1023. Uh, it will ask, and you can see down here, let me go 
here's the employer identification number that um, you had to apply for as you became a corporation. So you're, once you have, you actually have had to have gone through forming a corporation and getting an employer ID number before you're able to apply for nonprofit exempt status. But there are 40 pages to this and the 1023 is gonna ask you a lot of questions about things. So hang on a second. I, what I wanna do is I wanna share my screen. I wanna do a, a new share. I wanna get on the internet here. Okay. Are you able, I need to ask you a question. Are you able to see the uh, internet screen that I'm on right here? Can somebody uh, let me know if they've been, oops, previous, previous. Like I said, I'm a little bit rusty at this because I haven't quite mastered Zoom. Okay, thank you guys for entering the chat here. Okay, okay. So basically, so I'm gonna do a new share. And I'm gonna do, oh. Here we go, here we go, okay. So let's go to, let's go to the form 1023. Real quick, let me call this up real quick. And we can scroll through. A little bit and you can see a little better. Let's see. Okay, I want to do another new share. Okay, bear with me just one minute, if you wouldn't mind, until I am able to get this up. Okay. Now, hang on a second. I'm going to stop the screen share really quickly. We'll get back to this just real quick so I can open up the form 1023. Okay, all righty. Back to back to our uh, slideshow. The share screen here. All right. Once again, can you see the the instructions for form twenty three on my screen? Just want to make double sure. Okay, excellent, thank you. I appreciate that. So here's the instructions for the form 1023 that you're gonna see on the, uh, when, you, when you decide that you want a, 
or when you need to, you could see that there's a lot of, a lot of instructions here. <laughs> so I'm just going to scroll through this really quickly to show you how much uh, work, actually how much work, I'm, I wanted to tell you how much work it is to fill out at the 1023. Let's see, I think it's down here at the bottom. Oh, okay. Let's go back up at the top. It asks all kinds of information. Here's the instructions. It is absolutely crazy, right? But you have to do that. And you can, um, talks about how they are going to be able to qualify you as a public charity, basically. Again, it has a lot more information here uh, that you can look at as reference. Uh, you know what, I will, when I have the presentation sent out to everybody, I'll include in that presentation, the website here that you can also go to and uh, look at in a little bit more detail. So uh, let's go back to our presentation here. Get back to the right page. I hope that was helpful. Uh, I think it's a little easier when I can show you some of those forms so that you can see what it looks like. So there's the SS4. Okay, the 1023 short form and then the 1023 long form. So um, I will, again, I'll send you the link that will take you to the instructions so that you can look at that. And then again, I'm pretty sure you can uh, apply online for this but you'll want to go through the instructions. It'll ask you a lot of information and I would recommend. It's almost like, kind of like a business plan uh, with the, all the information that they ask you on here. So I would take the instructions and I would manually answer the, uh, put the information, organize my information as it goes through the instructions. So then when you go to, uh, register online, you're able to take the information from your notes and just transfer it onto the form. So that's just a kind of a, a little a tip for you. This is the state exemption request. So not only do you have to fill out the 1023 for the IRS, to be tax exempt, you're going to also need to fill out a exemption request with the state of California. This is a form 3500A. And it's basically what happens is that what this says, it's an exemption based on the IRS codes. And this will also, you'll also get a corporate number from the state when you apply for being a corporation. And so here's the paperwork for being exempt from taxes for the state. Okay, there's page two. I just wanted to give you a, a feel for that. And the federal ID number that I talked about, what you'll do is you'll get a notification either in the email or a hard copy of it in the mail and it will assign a uh, employer federal ID number such as this one. And that is the identification that you're gonna use often with the state or uh, when you're uh, dealing with the federal government at any time. So this is a hard copy of that. That's a lot. And sometimes I think that it can be very overwhelming. And I think it's gonna probably, especially if it's a fairly long process. I think that's what I wanna reiterate. It's not just uh, open your doors and start operating. 
kind of a process, the process going about becoming a corporation and becoming tax exempt. As you can see, when we looked at all those forms, it's a fairly lengthy process. The question I always get is, are you able to operate your nonprofit before you have completed all of these steps? As, and I guess main question is, is can we take donations? And yes, you can take donations and you can use them to pay expenses for your nonprofit purpose before you get on the, the official notification. But if you are denied exemption, then just be aware that you'll have to refund that money to your donors because you have represented in your fundraising that you are a nonprofit and that that is an actual donation. If you're denied an exemption, what the, it's basically what it is is now the donor has just simply given you money. It's not a donation. But generally, you are, will not be denied an application, or I'm sorry, be denied the exemption. You may, however, be asked by the IRS or the state for additional information. And actually, they're quite picky about that. So when you apply for the on the 1023 form to the IRS for exemption, you want to be as detailed as possible. And that's, again, why I suggested that you make notes first before you go on. Because if there is inadequate information, they'll write back to you. You have to provide them with the additional information. And that will just extend the period before you're at, um, you are officially a tax-exempt charitable organization. Right now, the last time I checked, the Form 1023 EZ is a short turnaround time with the IRS as far as being granted an exemption. But if you fill out the Form 1023 long form, there's about a six month turnaround. Uh, so take that into consideration as you're doing your planning as well. So because you can take donations before you're officially considered a, a charitable nonprofit tax exempt organization, the next thing that you need to do is to open a separate nonprofit bank account. And there are a couple things that you need to take to the bank. Actually, this will vary from uh, bank to bank. I've had clients who have had difficulties opening a nonprofit bank account at certain banks. And if that's true, I have encouraged people to go ahead and uh, look, investigate opening it at another bank because they may have different requirements before they allow you to open a nonprofit bank account. So when you go to the bank, here's the documents that you'll need to take. If you're president of the board and you're gonna open the bank account, you've got to take your social security or driver's license. You're gonna take a copy of the federal ID uh, verification letter that we talked about just previously. You're gonna take a copy of these articles of incorporation and the uh, list of the board of directors. And then this one, I think can wait the copy of the IRS determination letter until you actually get that from the IRS. Uh, one of the other alternatives when you're opening your bank account is that you could set it up as a business bank account. And then when you get and make deposits into that, and then when you get the IRS determination letter about your tax exempt status, then the bank can help you convert that to a nonprofit bank account. Okay, here's a couple of miscellaneous more forms that you have to sign or you have to fill out, uh, you may have to fill out for your particular situation. If 
And this one comes down to if you have employees, you, you will have in your corporate nonprofit, you're going to have to file California employer ID number. And you're going to do this with the California Employment Development Department. So go online and Google that, and then you will see a place that you can apply for the California identification number. In a nonprofit, you can have employees. There's nothing to keep you from having employees. If you're a small nonprofit, you may just have volunteers. But if you are a more substantial nonprofit, you most likely will have employees that, such as consult, uh, somebody who runs your social media department. You've decided to make that a paid position. And if you do, in that case, you'll need to have a California ID number. The other things is if you sell merchandise and the profits go into your nonprofit, actually you're not exempt from paying sales tax. You actually do need to charge sales tax on that merchandise that you would sell through your nonprofit as a fundraiser. And if you, just, if you do that, you will have to apply for a, what's called a California seller's permit. And the place that you go to apply for that is the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. And it's not a big process, but you, what happens, as you may know, if you're selling merchandise and you're collecting sales tax, that's not your money. Basically what you're doing is you're an agent for the state of California and that that sales tax that you're holding for them needs to be remitted to the state on a quarterly basis. So that adds another level of reporting and filing forms if you're gonna sell merchandise as a fundraiser. Okay, finally, there are even more forms. And I imagine at this time, everybody's just going, oh my word, this is crazy. I'm gonna be spending most of my time uh, filling out forms. And I'm sorry to say that this is kind of true. Uh, what These are some annual tax and information returns that have to go to the agencies, the government agencies that you filed your paperwork with, work with previously. Uh, if you have employees, you will have to do payroll tax returns, which what I always recommend to people is if you have employees, that's probably a good time for you to get an accountant who can help you with the employee and the payroll tax return function of your nonprofit, because that could be quite involved and you don't want to make any errors with doing that because that can cause an issue with the state of California and the federal government. So if you do have employees, and you need to file payroll tax returns, my recommendation is enlisting some sort of a bookkeeper or an accountant. Also for the sales and use tax returns, if you've sold the merchandise, there's gonna be a form that you're gonna to have to fill out when you remit that sales tax to the state of California. Annually, you have to file a tax return for your nonprofit corporation. And those forms are for federal, here is a list of the forms for the federal that you can choose. There is a easy form, there's a long form, and then there's a postcard form, which basically is just, you know, here I've been operating all year and my sales have been, my proceeds, my gross, gross I'm sorry, my gross receipts have been less than 25,000 bucks. And then you just submit that to the IRS. But if you have a more a nonprofit that has more than $25,000, you'll have to fill out either the EZ or the 990 and report in much more detail than you would just report on the uh, nonprofit postcard, basically. And I want to uh, add that. The IRS, because you have 
applied for nonprofit status will actually expect your 990. And if you don't file it on time, you will be considered delinquent. And you don't want to go delinquent if you don't, if, with these forms. You also have to file one for, the Cal, for California. And the short form is the 199N, and the long form is the 199. So for these federal income tax returns, you're going to go to the IRS website. And for the California state returns, you're going to go to the California uh, state return website, which is called the Franchise Tax Board. So the, uh, California state tax returns, these forms you'll find on the Franchise Tax Board's uh, website. The statement of information that you filed with the Secretary of State has to be refiled every two years. And that basically keeps your corporation alive. It means that you are not suspended in operating as a corporation. And if you don't file the semi-annual statement of information, again, you'll probably get a notice that you need to file it or you've been delinquent in filing it. But if you let it go too long, and somebody goes to the Secretary, California Secretary of State's websites to look up your nonprofit, and you, you will see that it has been suspended. And then you'll have to go through the entire rigmarole of reinstating your corporation. So you want to make sure that you file this semi annual. So every other year, statement of information with the California Secretary of State. And then you also have to renew the form with the Attorney General's Registry of Charitable Trusts. So basically these two forms, they want to know that you are still operating, that it hasn't, your corporation and your nonprofit hasn't been formed as just some sort of a holding organization. They wanna make sure that you're operating and that you're, legitimate and that they can uh, verify to the public that you have an active uh, nonprofit corporation. And that form is called the RF, RRF1. So those are the technicalities of how you're gonna go about forming your corporation, tax exempt status, and all the tax and information returns that you'll need to file at the end of the year. And I think that at this point, we'll go ahead and take some questions. And I can clarify or answer any questions that you would have. I see that I do have a, a couple of questions down here. So let me see. Okay, my nonprofit, the question is, my nonprofit has made only $2 uh, from me testing the donation page, what form would I best use to file? Are there services I could do to hire this form for me? And yes, there are services that you can do. If you Google uh, forming a nonprofit, you'll find all kinds of places where people will offer to uh, do your nonprofit for you. Uh, it can be expensive. But if you're very leery about doing it correctly, then you might want to enlist the help of a paid agent. Um, hopefully, as time goes on, you're gonna uh, make more money, uh, or not make more money, receive more donations. And so, again, you might wanna, when you talk to somebody who is going to help you to file like the form, 1023 for um, tax exempt status, you may want to share that information with them that you're going to make more than $50,000 at some point in the purpose in the future, and that you'll be able to maybe file the 1023 form, the long form versus the short form. Okay, get a couple more questions here. Uh, I have 501c3 status dated back to February 22. Do I need to file the RF1 this month to keep compliant? 
So my answer to my question is that you do need to file the RRF1 initially. So if you haven't done that, you do need to do that. I hope that's the answer to the question. And then once you file that, then you need to do that on a semi-annual basis. Okay. Uh, you know what? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't answer this qu question about uh, setting up a nonprofit with all the forms and fees. That is something I didn't look at, but this is, I will do the research on that. And in addition to sending you the website that I talked about, I will also uh, send you the estimate of how much it's gonna cost you in fees to set up the nonprofit. Uh, so, and so I'll include that in the email. And so I'll have an answer to that at that time. Uh, yes, churches do have to fill out an SI-100 and because they are charitable, let's ask that question. You know what? I'm gonna ask that question to the internet just to make sure, let's see. That's da, 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 da. Okay, so can everybody see my screen here with that I'm on? Can you, can everybody see? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and Google uh, just so that we can find out religious um, profits file with charitable California, I guess it's California registry or charitable trusts. Okay. You know what? I don't I don't know. My answer right now is going to be yes, because as you noticed before, when I talked about what a non nonprofit was, it is a it is furthering a social clause cause and the listing there was uh, if, if it was a religious organization. So my answer there right now will be yes. And I will double check that again when I have a chance to do a little bit more research. And I can answer that question in the email. No, okay. So I'm gonna go back up here, make sure I'm answering this questions. Uh, okay. So yes, I'm gonna look at the questions in the chat as well. Okay, so do you need to register with a Cal if you create a not-for-profit? Yes, you do. And can you address the used, can the address used on the article of corporation be one of an existing business? It can be. It doesn't have to be a separate, uh, it does not have to be a separate address. But the question I would have is, in my mind, is there the perception from the public that somehow the two are intermingled, which would tell me that maybe having a separate address might be beneficial actually to your donors, because you're probably gonna to wanna to put your address on a letterhead or on your website or in some place such as that. And people may, like I said, think, wonder if your regular business is somehow connected to your nonprofit because of that. But that's more of a semantics thing than a regulation thing. Okay. Next question. Oh, perfect. 
here's somebody that already did this and was able to answer the question. Uh, Randy Martinez has answered this question and I really appreciate it. Thank you. He said he did his nonprofit as a church for religious organization and it cost him $3,500 to do that. So that gives you an idea. My question would be, is the $3,500 that you paid, uh, Randy, was that someone that you pay, paid to do it for you? Those are not just the fees associated with filing the forms is the question that I'm having. So if you could answer that question for us, Randy, I would appreciate it. Uh, the, the religious charity uh, does not need to be a church. It can be a fellowship. Basically, it does not need to be a church, a officially formed church. Oh, okay. And he says it's all included. Uh, so I'm thinking that you, it's got all of the uh, paperwork that he has done for $3,500. So that's really helpful. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Okay, so let's go over to the, whoops, here's another chat really quickly. So the question from Crystal Lively is the gross receipts is the amount of funds you have raised that year, not the amount after you have uh, funded the programs that you provided. So the so my, if I'm reading this question right, as the founder, you want to help fund your non for profit and you can you can definitely do that as a donor, where you actually give the fifty thousand dollars to fund the nonprofit, or you can actually do that as a loan to the nonprofit that you can uh, pay, get paid back from the nonprofit uh, when you have actually done the fund fundraising and donations of in a $50,000. So I hope that's clear. I hope that answers that question as well. Okay, good. You're welcome. Let's see, here's the questions, the chats. Okay. Okay, we, we've already asked one of the, we've answered one of these. Do you need to register with the California Registry of Charitable Trust if you create a not-for-profit? And yes, you do. Uh, is there a way I could see? You, uh, Randy, if you're still on, there is not a, I have to, would have to go to the settings to look at the chats, let me, let me do stop sharing here, basically. You'd have to go to the, uh, I'd have to go to the settings, I'm sorry to say, in order for you to see the chats. And while I'm in the webinar, I don't think I have that ability to actually let you see uh, the other chats. Okay, uh, we, I think we answered this one previously. Uh, the question is, is how much is the total process and time frame? And I will, the, the research I'm gonna do is to look at the cost of when you submit all of the, the fees. So uh, if you submit all the fees, I'm gonna, you know, the, the fees to the government when you apply. I th the answer that, that Randy gave us a little earlier was how much it was when he paid for somebody. Uh, when he paid somebody to do that. And like I said, the time frame depends on how long it takes you to incorporate and file your paperwork. And then as far as getting non exempt status from the IRS, if you do the 1023 short form, that's gonna be uh, a much shorter turnaround time that you'll be granted non profit exempt status. Whereas if you do the long form 1023, at this point, apparently it's taking about uh, one to two months. I think I said six months before because a couple of months ago when I had was working with a client to fill that out, 
it was about six months, but now somebody's chimed in on chat, which I appreciate, and said that it took them one to two months. So it's still not a long turnaround. And it will probably take a while for you to get your, your chat up and run, your, or your uh, nonprofit up and running. Okay. Okay, here's a question. Can a nonprofit established in California help people in other states? Great question. Absolutely. In fact, I, I had formed my nonprofit in California called Just One Person. And we actually, what we do is we help fund education for girls in Kenya. So not only can it be other states, but it can also be internationally. Okay, it seems to be, there's a, somebody wants, would like to look again at the difference between a nonprofit and a not-for-profit. So in just a second, I'll go back to that. And we'll look at the slides again. So, and I'll address that question. Okay. So the next question is where can I find the business write off? That one, I'm not exactly sure if what I'm, what you're asking, I'm not sure if I'm understanding correctly what you're asking. Can you write, this is Linda. Bugs Night, if you can elaborate a little bit on your question, uh, I'll be able to answer that better. What is the best first step? Filing for an EIN? Yes, definitely file for an EIN and then file for tax exempt status. Absolutely. Once you're incorporated, you can file for your EIN, your employer identification number and then you can apply for tax exempt status. Okay. Can the addresses used on the article for the nonprofit be one of an existing business? I think I answered that one already. Does the SBA have a list of trustworthy treasurer op options? If not, what kind of things should I look for to identify a trustworthy person? a sort of checklist. I'm gonna send you a link to another website that I have used a lot that has resources exactly like that, about, uh, that where you may be able to find a checklist for enlisting a treasurer as a, uh, a trusting person, a trustworthy person. So, I will definitely send you a website on that where there are, are a lot of resources again. All right, I love it. I love these questions. Okay, absolutely. But, uh, you'll receive an email. All participants of today's webinar will receive an email with the information that I've talked about that I'll put in the email. So everybody will get the same information. So another question, I have a client that created a nonprofit before the pandemic, ended up moving and never did anything. They are not able. Uh, so the question is, uh, can, I, can I continue with the nonprofit if it has just been dormant for a certain period of time? Actually, the thing that will go dormant will be your corporation that you'll have to be reinstated as a corporation. And it depends on how long you've done that. And that's actually right before the pandemic. So what I would suggest is go on the, the website, the uh, California Sec Secretary of State website, search for the name of that nonprofit. It'll bring that nonprofit name up. You can click on that and it'll show you the status. It'll either say active status or it will say uh, suspended status. And if it's suspended, it's a diff, it's a diff, kind of a difficult thing to reinstate it. And at that point, you might want to use an accountant who can help you with that process. That happened with another nonprofit that I was working with. 
and we ended up hiring somebody to do the reinstatement of the non of the corporation. Uh, when applied for EIN, do I check that it's a corporation when it's asked about the structure? Yes, you do. And if it asks what type of nonprofit is, what should I say if I help give food to people who need, need it? You are a, basically what you're gonna state in your application for your tax exempt status is you're going to put your mission statement there and you're furthering a charitable cause if your program is actually giving food to people who need it. So for example, you're kind of like my nonprofit that is educating girls in Africa. What you're going, what you are doing is that you're feeding food to people who need it. So you're gonna to wanna to expound on exactly what your nonprofit does because when you operate your nonprofit, it has to be in compliance with the mission that you've, that you've stated. So for example, if you are a nonprofit that feeds people and all of a sudden you decide that you're going to fund people who do scientific research, that's not in compliance with your original mission. And so that's not allowed. I hope, I hope that answers the question. It all depends on your narration, on your uh, application for non-exempt status. That will determine what your purpose is and what kind of activities that you're going to be operating around your mission. Okay, we, um, I can send the, there's a, somebody here asking about accountant options and there are no SBA verified accountants, unfortunately. And the chapter that I belong to of SCORE is called the Capital Corridor chapter, which covers from Stockton to the Oregon border. And we do have a referral page for accountants and other professionals. And I, I can also attach that to the web, the link that I, or the email that I'm sending you. So that has some accounting options, basically. What I tell people when they're trying to find a, an accountant, I'm, in, I'm located personally in Chico. So I really don't know the Sacramento area or I don't know the area where you are particularly located, but really the best way to choose an accountant is to ask around and get recommendations. And that really takes the guesswork out of it. You're going to look at things like how quickly do they uh, answer my questions? How quickly can I make an appointment with them? You know, what kind of fees do they charge? And things such as that. So, but I will attach the uh, resources for professionals to that email as well. It's going to be a dang long email. <laughs> but I promise to get your questions all answered. Okay. If you're on the board of director but have no other employees, paid employees, are you considered an employee? No, you are not. You are totally considered a volunteer. And so uh, it's only when you actually set them up as an employee. And that means that you're going to pay them as an employee. And then you're going to have to do all of the your things that you would do as an employee of any other business. You're gonna to have to withhold social security and Medicare. You're gonna to have to withhold uh, state and federal tax. You're gonna to have to file payroll tax returns. And at the end of the year, you'd have to file a W-2, just like if you are an employee of another business. So, but if something, somebody is totally a volunteer, you do not have to do, consider them an employee. Okay, you answered the question, can my nonprofit donate to my non to a nonprofit? Can the nonprofit hire contractual workers from my nonprofit? So I'm trying to think of what that is asking right now. So you have two separate nonprofits. 
It's a tutoring service. The nonprofit will have an educational social mission. Everyone can afford quality tutoring. So can my nonprofit be contractually hired to provide tutors or will my nonprofit have to donate these services? Okay, yes, you cannot sell your service, sell the services which you are providing for the public good. Uh, the only things that can go, the only gross receipts that can go into your nonprofit are going to be donations or uh, proceeds from fundraisers or proceeds from the sale of merchandise that is associated with your nonprofit. So no, you can't run your nonprofit as a business. Uh, okay, so here's, can you help her? She thinks I'm asking nonprofit to nonprofit. Okay, so Valerie, if you can rephrase that question, uh, maybe I can answer that better if you haven't, if that's not the answer that you're looking for. So if you can rephrase that, that would be great. I want to write off business equipment, internet office furniture, da, 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 da. Okay, that is basically, what you're talking about is the corporation's a, a business, but there is no reason to reduce the amount of your gross receipts because you're not paying taxes on it. So when you file the form 990, which is the tax form that you're gonna file at the end of the year to report gross receipts and expenses to the IRS, you will have a place to report all the expenses that you've written. On one of the pages, it will have a schedule and it will list uh, the usual types of expenses that you have, and you'll be able, you'll fill those expenses out, basically, and that will include things like your uh, internet and your office equipment and your cell phone and your advertising and your fundraising expenses, and uh, all of the expenses that you um, will have, and it will reduce your gross receipts, but it's it's not really technically a write-off like you would think of for a regular business. It's an informational term. Okay, let's see. I'm getting more chats and more questions and answers. So I'm gonna keep going back and forth and kind of working through these. It's almost 11.30. Is uh, everybody good with just continuing to go? Okay. Okay, Randy is asking a question about, are there resources, community resources to, I assume, help you fundraise with or mentorships that I can get in contact with? Once again, I'm gonna send you some links to some really good nonprofit resources. There's a two or three really good websites that I think will answer this question. But as far as community resources, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Uh, and mentorship, once again, I think one of these websites that I'm going to send to you would be the best place for you to connect with a mentor to help you. Okay. Here's... Let's see, here's another question and answer. So hang on a second. So I think I got all the chats answered. Here's the question and answers. Okay, so have I answered all the questions at this point that everybody has asked? We're right at the 1130 mark. Uh, could, so, Please see above from Valerie. Okay. I see above and here's a chat. Okay, so this is, okay. So Valerie's question again is earlier, a participant asked, can their for-profit donate to the nonprofit? Oh, oh, I see. My question is, can tutors from 
my for-profit be contractually hired by my nonprofit? Oh, oh, excellent. No, actually, you can actually contractually hire people from your for-profit business. I didn't read that question right. I apologize for that. So yes, you could contractually, you could contractually hire anybody, uh, any type of professional that you want. Uh, again, intermingling your nonprofit and your profit for-profit business can kind of be a tricky thing because what is happening, this is more of a best practices issue. Your nonprofit is the donations that you're getting from your donors. They want to be assured that the funds are being used in providing the services to your beneficiaries. So the appearance of hiring a contractual worker from your for-profit business may come under question by some donors, but there is no hard and fast rule that you cannot do that. It would just be like having your nonprofit hire somebody to do their accounting or hiring an attorney. It's, there's no difference. It's just a matter of appearance. Okay, Randy asked as far as um, doing the, okay. Yeah, and actually somebody made the uh, comment here about watching out for a conflict of interest appearance as well, which is what I just talked about as well. So, uh, and Randy, again, I'll send you the resources where you can hook up with a mentor. Any other questions? I know this has been a lot, but I think by having the nonprofit uh, PowerPoint, it'll really be able to help you to under, to go back and use it as a reference. And I think the last question here is, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Somebody wanted to talk about the difference between a Okay, up, oh, up, oh, up, oh. I stopped. Okay, share screen. Okay, let's go back to this, this screen about what's a not profit, non profit and a not for profit. It is. Okay, so a nonprofit, a 501c3, is a nonprofit organization that is not making, not trying to make profit, whose mission focuses on a public good by furthering a social cause. So basically, a nonprofit is offering its services to a general group of people outside of its membership. There are no members in a nonprofit. So in my case, my beneficiaries in Kenya are girls who are rural, rural girls. So, and that's my social cause. And that's why I'm called a nonprofit. But a not, a not for profit is strictly uh, membership organizations. So again, basically these are memberships. It's like the Chamber of Commerce is a not for profit because businesses generally have to pay dues to belong to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if it's a social and recreational club like youth soccer, generally participants who are going to join a recreational league will have to pay some sort of a fee to join that, that club, whether it's little league or youth soccer or some, some such as that. So if you have further questions, you can also look at this, but I hope that this kind of helps you see the difference between those two and that that answers that question. Okay, a couple more questions. Okay, it says, could the address, oh, that's not it. 
If you choose to be sponsored by an established 501 Street 3, what would be the process for that? Can you clarify that question a little bit? I'm not 100% sure what you mean. If you will be a, a pros, if you're the one who is on the receiving end of the nonprofit's uh, services, if, is that what you're asking about? Basically, what the nonprofit does is organize the events and seek out people who will receive their services. So when we operate my nonprofit in Kenya, what we have done is we've visited schools in rural Kenya and we've enlisted girls in our program that we now provide services for. So basically, if to use another example, the person who is providing food for people who need it, they probably will set up some sort of a food pantry someplace. And when they advertise it, people who need that services will come to the nonprofit's location, the food pantry, and uh, take advantage of their services. So I, I hope that answers that question. Okay, a follow-up question to stay in compliance when putting the type of nonprofit we are in in the EIN application. Should I put each activity we are planning on? You know what, the more detail, the better. Uh, I'm not sure if you, Audrey is the one who asked about the pe giving food to people who need it, but if you give food, if all that you do is give food to people who need it, that's enough of a discussion. You may use it, you may add an appendix on, or a addendum onto that and say for natural disasters or for uh, floods or as long as you're bringing food to people, that's your nonprofit mission, you do not have to do every activity. But if you do more than just bring food to people, yes, you will need to list that, basically. And you can make it more general. If you're going to bring food to people who need it in a natural disaster, maybe you could say something like bringing resources to people in a natural disaster. But if it's really disparate, right? So if I'm going to bring food to people in a national disaster, and I'm also going to hold seminars about natural disasters or climate change, well, now you have two disparate kinds of activities that you're doing so that you would need to include that in the activities that you'll be separately in the activities you'll be doing uh, in your nonprofit. If it's just one, type of a uh, mission that you have, you can make it general. If it's different kinds of activities, but operating still under the same nonprofit, then you will need to uh, list those activities separately. Okay, one more chat. Okay. This is great. This is, I'm not sure if people can see the chat. I'm not sure if this is how this works. But Randy Martinez, one of the participants here. Randy, can you uh, give me your email address for your religious startup that I could maybe include in the email that I have? Or in this case, I see Randy is saying that you could actually go to his nonprofit, which I think is called uh, Start Church which I think is what you're going to Google when you go to the uh, website. And then you'll go to the website and have a way to get in touch with Randy Martinez. And in the meantime, I'm not sure if Randy's still in attendance, uh, I could actually, oh, okay. So if you go to Start Church, 
on the internet, ask for the person who is named Ardell and they can give you some assistance with starting up. And that's great. And you want to say, and I'm actually going to write this information now. You're going to ask for a person named Adele at Start Church. And you're going to tell them Randy Martinez sent you. Martinez. And he is with Sola Scriptura Scrubs. Sola Scriptura, which is his organization. So that that will uh, give you a segue into why you're, you've gotten a hold of them. Okay. Wow. Thank you for all these questions. That's great. Okay, Audrey, that's okay. Yes. You know what? I um, inadvertently left amount, the amount of the fee for incorporating there out, but that is information that I'll send in this legendary email. That I'm going to send after the after the uh, presentation. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, and I so I oh the last thing oh shoot 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 I'm going to share my screen one more time. Okay, there will be a part two actually. I wanted to show you. Okay, so there will be a part two to this uh, presentation, and I call it the nuts and bolts of operating your nonprofit. It's on March 9th, 2023, at 10 o'clock. And here's some of the issues that we'll address in that presentation. Uh, what to do about research before you actually start your nonprofit and how to choose a board of directors. And probably I'll address a little bit more detail about how to choose a trustworthy treasurer in that one. We'll talk about defining the mission of your nonprofit. You actually should write a business plan for your nonprofit. The business plan, well, it doesn't have to be an extensive business plan, but the business plan ends up being a document that helps you communicate with your volunteers and other people who are working with your nonprofit. You have a, so that there's like common information, everybody's on the same page. I'll talk about grant funding, and then I'll also give a lot of other nonprofit resources that you can use uh, in order to operate your nonprofit, uh, learn more, operate your nonprofit, find additional resources. So, uh, there's one more. Uh, yes, incorporate before you uh, apply for EIN, Audrey. Okay, so that's the presentation for today. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, look forward to my, uh, keep a lookout for my email where I can answer a few more of your questions. And it's been great. Hope to see you at part two where we talk a little we talk a little bit more in depth about operating it rather than just the technicalities of starting it. Bye.